Welcome everybody, Parashat Toldot. Our learning today is dedicated in loving memory and Leilui Nishmat Maria at Rachel Alea Shalom by her daughter, Vivet Ancona. Thank you. Um, also in loving memory, Nishmat, Dan Ben Rachel by Marilyn Clitman. And uh, in memory of Penina Bat Esther, a woman who dedicated her life to her husband, her family, including her 10 sisters and brothers. Um, I hope all of their neshamot are elevated to the highest realms. Okay, so thank you for joining us here live and in Zoom. Um, if you have your humashim, I would love for you to open to Parashat Toldot. It's chapter 25. Pasuk 19 in Sefer Pereshit. Um, today I want to address the one of the concepts that keeps tapping. It keeps giving us like a little tap on the shoulder, but we don't really pay it so much attention. This week, the Torah is going to dedicate an entire chapter, an entire uh, pedic to this concept. But before I introduce it to you, I want to start the perasha and use it as a segue. So the perasha starts with Ele Toldot Yitzchak Ben Abraham. This is the story. These are the generations. This is the outcome. This is what bursts forth from Yitzchak, the son of Abraham. And then it tells us the obvious, and there are many commentaries on this, that Abraham Holid et Yitzchak, which seems to be an obvious statement. If the we're talking about Yitzchak, the son of Abraham, then it's obvious that Abraham has given birth to Yitzchak. There's something more that's taking place, and I think that's where I'm going to want the lesson today um, to start to um, develop. So already, in moving forward. In moving forward, meaning we gleaned the Abraham Sarah story. We're sitting here today ready to hear about the Yitzchak Rivka story, but that story can't happen without bringing Abraham, Abraham Baba Yamim, we had seen last week. He brought his days, he brings his past. You can't just in Torah and it's a cyclical um, approach. We don't just move from one phase to another. We take our phases with us. Sarah took her seven-year-old into her 20-year-old and took her 20-year-old into her hundred-year-old. And that's how she was able to be the woman that she was at a hundred because she brought all her prior selves with her. And the Torah is trying to tell us we're not only a manifest, we're not only a um, product of where and who we've been, but to what degree do those earlier selves that we were, do, do we bring them into the present day? And now this week, the Torah is saying, we don't just bring in our curiosity and our love of life and our innocence from our youth. We don't just bring in those things to our future evolving selves. The Torah is telling us today, we also bring in our ancestors. I'm going to tell you a story about Yitzhak, but before I do, don't think that Yitzhak is an island unto himself. He is a product of Abraham. And why do we say that? Because whatever we're going to see about Abraham, we have to recognize that he's building on what I'm saying, whatever we see about Yitzchak, we have to realize that he's building on what Abraham had established. Sarah, we need to keep pressing the admit all, don't forget. Sorry, I just did. <laughs> um, so let's keep moving forward. Verse 20, Yitzchak is 40 years old when he takes Rivka. Now, guess what? Abraham's not the only one who has a past. Abraham's... I, I keep saying Abraham, I mean Yitzchak. Yitzchak is not the only one who has a past, who has a father, who has a lineage that we're bringing into the story. Rivka too has 
And we're going to hear, and whenever the Torah gives us genealogy of a person, like with Rivka, they're going to tell us who her father was and who her family was, it's to add to her importance. So she is, he was 40 when he took Rivka, the daughter of Betuel Harami. She comes from Padan Aram. She's Achot Lavan Harami. We have so many words to describe Rivka. If you like playing with word numbers, it happens to be nine words to describe Rivka. So we could maybe get a foreshadowing. This is going to talk about the nine months of pregnancy. But she, he takes her, Lola Isha, he takes her as a wife to himself. And here is where the story starts to get interesting. So we're familiar with this. We're familiar with the male figure going to entreat God, going to beseech God when he needs something. What we're not familiar with is what's about to happen. So Yitzchak is going to go and he's going to pray to Hashem. And we all know this already. We're so much sharper today because we know that the God that he's praying to, we know that the Yud Kevav Ke name for God is the God of Rachamim, the God of the Rechem, the God of the womb, the God who got his name when Chava first had her child. So clearly if he's going to pray to Yud Kevav Ke, it's regarding this thing called uh, having an offspring. But what does he do? He prays, he's diametrically, he's diagonal, he's diagonal from his wife. Wait a minute. We've never seen before in Torah, husband and wife, both praying and both coming to God. Watch. So either, you see that the word he is spelt who? It's a kri uchtiv. It's spelt like the male version, but it's pronounced like the female version. And the commentaries have a party and they say, who was the infertile one? Was it him? Was it her? Was it both of them? And the only reason we're asking this question is because by Avraham, we thought that Sarah was the infertile one. And that's how we ended up with the whole Hagar story is she felt that she couldn't have a child. So why should Abraham be um, held back? Why should he not be able to realize and fulfill his dream of having a child? Here, we're not so sure. And you'll find commentaries on both sides. Some say it was Yitzchak. Some say it was Rivka. Some say that both of them, and that's why they both come to pray. But one of the beautiful words that I want to pay attention to today, because it's going to segue us into our class, is this word, va-yetar. This word, yetar, this form of prayer, an etir, happens to be a pitchfork. What is a pitchfork? Well, why would I use the word for a pitchfork to describe the type of prayer that Yitzchak and Rivka are undergoing? A pitchfork is what's used to, separ to separate the wheat from the chaff. And how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? You take a pitchfork and you throw up the wheat. The wheat will disperse and then the, I mean, the chaff will disperse and you'll keep the wheat. What does this have to do with our prayer? Yitzchak realizes that something needs to be overturned. There's a gezera, there's a decree in the world, and he understands something even better, and so does Rivka. That even though in the natural world, we are incapable of bearing children, God, Yud Kevavke, the God of the womb, of the Rechem, of Rachamim, of mercy, he has the ability to do what? Take a gezera, to take a decree and overturn it. So for us reading this today, this is a license to say, stop being so practical. Stop being so rational. I know that in your myth and I know that in your calculations, what happens? We think that we can't even pray. Why can't we pray? Because it doesn't make sense. What should I pray for? The doctor already said, that I can't have children. So why bother praying? And Rivka and Yitzchak are here to teach us something totally different. 
If you're going to live by the parameters of the natural world, then you're going to limit yourself or even worse, you're going to take away your ability to pray because you're going to think that it's useless. What's the use? Why should I pray? It's not going to change. How is prayer? How are words? How are expressions of mind going to change my physical reality is a very normal, logical thought process. But Yitzchak and Rivka are here to teach us today, there's something called vayetar. There's actually a prayer, a form of a prayer that if you believe that the God who created the natural world could turn it upside down, could change its course, could render the impossible possible, then you'll at least have the guts to pray because you don't want to feel, and this is, and the Torah recognizes this. It's very sensitive to us. It recognizes that as human beings, we're practical. Why should I pray for something ridiculous? It's a waste of my time. It makes me look like a crazy person. It makes me look like I don't have a handle on reality. And the Torah is telling us, take the word reality and recognize that your reality and God's reality is not one and the same. Because God's reality, what's real for God? What's emet for God? God's reality is that anything is possible. That's his reality. So what do I want to do? I want to get out of my own reality, which has confines, which has boundaries. My reality has boundaries. I can't help it. That's I live in the physical world. But I want to go to God and to his reality. His reality is he created the world. He could have anything happen. Anything. What do you want to happen? That there's a decree that the Jews of Shushan are going to be obliterated on a certain day and the letters went out and everybody's ready to point their guns and missiles towards us. And what happens? Instead of them destroying us, we end up being victorious. And the person who wrote the decree is hanging on a tree that he prepared for our people. Where does that happen? Can anybody write that script? At that point, when the picture looks completely black, what could we pray for? We don't even know what to ask for. As far as we're concerned in our reality, it's game over. Get under the covers, get into your shelter, and just hope that the least damage possible happens. Do you imagine? that our representative is gonna be riding on the king's horse and being led by the person who wants to kill us. These things, and the Torah is here telling it to us, they do happen, but they happen in God's reality. If we wanna tap into that reality, then we have a whole new set of opportunities available to us. That's what's taking place in this week's parasha. Yitzchak and his wife, are praying because she's an akara. What makes it so exciting are the commentaries that say that akara means she doesn't have a womb. You don't have a womb, I'm sorry. There's just so much we could do for you. We could give you the shots. We could do a million things. But if you don't have a womb, that's a tough one. You're asking me, you ever read the book, Something from Nothing? You're giving me nothing to work with. And what does the Torah say? Stop with the nonsense. Stop looking at the roadblocks. In your reality, <clears throat> there are a lot of roadblocks. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I'm aware of it, says the Torah. But now, look at what happens when Yitzchak and Rivka are going to pray together. The next, we don't even have to <clears throat> go to the next verse. And that's also what's beautiful about seeing the Pesukim in the Torah. If you look at verse 21, in the same verse that they go out and entreat God and they ask him to overturn. What does that mean, by the way? I'm just going to stop for one second and be clear about this point. A person who's willing to come to God and pray when they know that the odds are completely stacked against them or there are no odds in our assessment, in our physical assessment of the situation, 
There is no way out. The person who's willing to come to God and pray to him at that point is making a very big statement. They're saying, <clears throat> I recognize my limitations, but I also recognize God that you are infinite, that you have no limitations. The only thing that gives me the chutzpah to go and ask you for the craziest, most impossible thing is the knowledge that I believe God that you could do anything. That's a, that's, a big, that's a big statement to make. To make a statement to say, God, I know it's over. I know it's, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a small person. I know when I'm beat, but I also know that you're engaged with the world. And if you decide to just blink, God, to just breathe, if you decide to just put one finger out with that, you can change the entire physical world. That belief will bring us and give us the guts to even pray, the energy to even pray. Because most people, when they're in the dumps, I'm calling this in the dumps because there's no way out. When they're in the dumps, it's very hard for them to have hope and very hard to find faith and very hard to believe in these possibilities. And the Torah is saying both of them, they asked, for God to do something that's overturning a gezerah. And in the same verse, by lo Hashem, God answers him. I know that the commentaries love to say that she especially, that he was answered. Some people say he was answered because he was the one who was infertile. Some people say he was answered because he's the son of a tzaddik. That's why it started to tell us that he's the son of Abraham. But either way, Rivka, his wife, becomes pregnant. And the next verse, the children, Habanim, they're already children. They're not embryos. They're already in chapter 26, which is the middle of Parashat Toldot, which seems to be a commercial break of a narrative that talks about the brothers um, giving up, uh, trading the birthright. And after this, the brothers are going to both want the blessing from the father. In between the birthright sale and the blessing comes chapter 26, which we had just said starts with there being a famine in the land. What is the earth saying? The earth doesn't use words. It doesn't speak. It's not verbal. But the way the earth responds, the response of the earth is a clear indication of humanity's behavior. We know it from the Shema. If you behave, what's going to happen? The land's going to give you vula. It's going to give up all of her bounty. And if you don't behave, what's going to happen? The earth is going to withhold its energy from you. Well, today, verse one, chapter 26, what's the earth doing? Vahira ba'ad, it's dim. Excuse my language. What does that mean? It means that if I read these words, something's wrong. If the land could talk, what would it say? Oh, very nice. You don't give your brother food when he's hungry. Well, guess what? I'm gonna not give you food. I'm going to show you what it feels like. The earth is teaching us a lesson here. And I want to say that because when we go into chapter 26, there's a huge um, recognition that we have to have. When you're planting seeds and they're not growing, what has to happen? We have to ask, what's wrong? And the Torah is telling us for today, when there isn't a bounty where there should be, when the nature isn't behaving according to its design, what does it mean? It was designed to work and now it's not. And the Torah is saying, you broke it. Your actions broke nature and you want nature to get fixed. What do you have to do? You have to look, you have to look inside yourself and ask yourself. And that's what brings us to chapter 26 today 
with a new appreciation for something we had been seeing, but maybe we didn't pay it all the attention it deserved. So let's look at it together. Yeah. They go to Gerar and um, God appears to him and tells him, make sure you don't go as, as far south as where? As Egypt. And many of the commentaries say that because he was this close to being a sacrifice, he's Kodesh, he can't leave the confines of the land of Israel. And he says, stay in the land that you're in, which is Israel proper. Gur ba'aretz hazot, stay in this land, I will be with you, I will bless you, and these lands I will give to all your children, and I will uphold the shivu'ah. I will uphold the oath, the swearing that I made to Abraham, your father. And here it is. You're going to have children like the stars in the sky. And your children are going to inherit the land. And everybody's going to be blessed as a result of you. And why is this Ekev? Because you're coming on the Ekev, on the heels, on the footprints. You're attaching yourself to who? We started our class by saying, Abraham holid et Yitzchak. Don't underestimate that, yes, me by myself, I have, that's what's so beautiful about Rivka. Rivka didn't have Abraham as a father. So she didn't have legacy. You know, in the colleges, they look for legacy. Did you have a brother, an uncle, somebody who came to the college before you? Even if you don't have legacy and you're Rivka, right? The sister of Laban, the daughter of Betuel from Aram, Naharayim, even if that's who you are, what does everybody have? You could start your own legacy. But know this, us today, we have legacy. And the legacy has a promise attached to it. And the promise is, I will give you children, I will give you blessings, I will give you land, I will give you bounty. And the minute we don't see those blessings manifesting, we have to stop and literally go bikirba, go inside ourselves and really search our recesses to say, what is unnatural about our behavior that's prompting the blessing to not manifest and what's prompting the earth to act unnaturally. And now it says um, in verse seven, uh, Yitzchak, stays in Gerar, verse six, and the people ask about his wife, and we have this whole story where she's very beautiful, and um, they are afraid, he's afraid, so he says, she's my sister. Do we see a, a pattern here repeating itself? And she ends up getting taken to the king, and I uh, know she doesn't get taken to the king. She's just very beautiful. But the king has is keeping his eye on her. He's scouting her because why else would we see in verse eight that after some days and days and texts could even be years after some years of Imelech is looking out through his window and he sees Yitzchak metzachek et rivka ishto. He sees her behaving in a way with his wife that led him to understand that these two are not brother and sister. And Abimelech calls Yitzchak and he says, hey, that's really your wife. Why'd you tell me it's your sister? And Yitzchak answers and he says, I was afraid that I would be killed on her behalf because it's okay to murder in those Mesopotamian cultures, you could murder the husband and take the wife but you can't commit adultery. You can't take um, somebody else's wife. So just to show you how warped everything was back then. Anyway, um, Avimelech accuses him and says, you almost brought us to a place of great uh, sin and shame. And then we see this odd thing. Verse 12, Yitzchak plants 100 barleys or she'arim, which are also gates, but let's go with barleys for today, it's easier. Otherwise we're gonna end up in a Kabbalistic place. He plants a hundred barleys and God blesses him. Um, the understanding is that whatever he put into the ground, 100 fold 
emerged. Now we're thinking to ourselves, we left a place because there was a famine. We go to another place and in that place, rather than have a famine, what do we have? The complete opposite. We have a surplus. We plant one and we get a hundred. So I have to say something else is going on here other than an agricultural phenomena. So what happens right here? The text comes right in here and says, Yitzchak goes from there in verse 17, then verse 18, he goes and he starts to dig up wells of water. And this is finally, took me all this time, I'm sorry to get here, but I wanna talk about the concept of what a bit is. What is a well? What does it symbolize? And what does it signify for us in text? And why here and now is Yitzchak busying himself with well digging of all things? And you might say, oh, he needed to dig wells because he got a hundred fold crop and maybe he needed to use the water from the wells to irrigate his um, agriculture and his fields, which is a very nice thing, but I think something else is taking place here. And they're not just wells, and this is what makes it so beautiful. He said he's redigging the wells that his father Abraham had dug originally, but that the Pelish team had covered after Abraham died. And he gives them names. And when the servants of Yitzchak in verse 19, redig the wells, they find Mayim Chaim, living waters. I'd like to suggest that something is taking place here that is way beyond just digging for wells. So let's talk about first the easy part. What is a well? What is a well? You find a piece of earth, you start digging and digging and digging and digging, Sometimes you hit water, sometimes you don't, right? It's like, like oil, right? And you keep digging, but there's an energy that's taking place. And that energy is what? Is from above to below. We're going deep. We're going down. We're going from up to down. Yes. Could it be, I'm sorry? Could it be metaphorically a lech lecha? I happen to love that because she's saying, is it, I'm going to add a little piece to you. Is it like Abraham where you're going from one realm, from one state of consciousness to another? If by lech lecha you mean that Abraham went south, which means that he went from the brain to the heart, which means that he went from the rational to the emotional, which means that he needed to recognize that intellect is not the only way to access God, but there comes a place for compassion. Especially since Yitzchak is redigging Abraham's original wells. Is that what you're saying? Because I'm so happy and impressed with what you're saying. No, I, I love it because it really blends beautifully to where I want to take you. What is Yitzchak doing? If we go metaphorically and we say he's taking on the surface, you may only see dirt or dust or ground but knowing that beneath the surface, what lies beneath, if, you, if I took you on a field trip and showed you the ground and told you there's water coursing under this area, and especially, let's not forget, we're talking about Eretz Yisrael. There's more sand and more beige and more dry and more arid than you ever could imagine. So the likelihood that you're going to imagine that there's water under this dry arid sand is not such an easy concept to uh, um, perceive. And what is the Torah telling us? The Torah is telling us that Yitzchak recognized that in order for him to access this place, now you could call Mayim Hayim, what do you want to talk about those words? Living waters. There's a source of life maybe the source of all life. 
maybe the words water and life are often synonymous for the most practical of reasons because you could survive without many things on planet earth but without water you cannot maybe because the human body is comprised of so much water maybe because three quarters or two thirds of our world itself is water so water plays a pivotal role in our survival and our existence but at the same time that water plays that role what else plays a huge role in our existence in our literally mental health and physical health in order for us to be able to survive the torah is saying we have to tap into we have to dig down deeper we can't just accept what we see on the surface we have to go down there's a phrase yerida letzorech aliyah we have to sometimes go down in order to come back up so wherever it is that we are, if we're in the Avraham realm of intellect, like you said, the Lech Lecha, it's not enough to just approach the world from a scientific knowledge uh, viewpoint. You also have to engage with the world using your heart, using an emotional, compassionate approach. Because what would happen to Rivka if she only read the sonograms? and wasn't having a child, what would happen? She would never, you have to go down deep and search, search inside of yourself to say, am I more than just the molecules and the cells that I am comprised of? Is there more to me or am I just seeing myself from a surface? And what Yitzhak is doing by digging these wells is he's going beneath the surface. And he's looking to not just uncover or discover, what is he teaching all of us at this point? And there's so many lessons to be had here. That even in a time of Ra'av, where the likelihood of even planting anything is a little bit precarious, plant one seed. Don't worry. Why does God give him 100? Why do I need to know that? God could have just operated naturally, which is you plant one sapling, you get one tree or whatever you get, one growth. Why give him a hundred times? Because that's God's message to us. Just meet me. You take one step, I'll take the other 99, says God, because I know how hard it is for you to take that one step. And I know how hard, but you know what uh, uh, Yitzhak is going to do? He's going to keep going and he's going to keep digging. And now I'd like to talk about what all of this digging actually represents for us. So what does a be'er in Torah represent? Let's first start with that. What does a be'er represent for us? Yes, there's water beneath, but what happens with that water beneath? In order to access it, we have to go from above to below in order to discover it or uncover it. But if we actually want the water, what do we have to do? We have to take it from below to above. So there's a relationship with a well where the energies might start from below, I'm sorry, from above to below. But in order to actually get the prize, you also have to do what? orient yourselves, orient the energies from below to above. That's what's going to give you Chaim. That's the Mayim Chaim. And then there are all the other metaphors that come along with that. Why does it have to tell me that the Pelish team covered up Abraham's wells? Who would do such a thing? You have, imagine, a working oil uh, hole. I don't even know the words for it. You have it working and producing and the ticker of how much money all that oil is worth by the minutes, tick, 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 tick. Why would you close that up? Because maybe it wasn't just about the waters and just about the wells. Maybe what the Pillish team wanted to do was suppress what? Was suppress this notion, this concept that the world is more than just what meets the eye. Because as long as there's water coming out of a desert, 
What is that saying to you? Anything is possible. Opposites are possible. Dry could become wet, wet could become dry. And how do we meet Rivka? Why does she become this iconic person who's able to draw, literally draw out God? Because she's been drawing water ever since she was a little girl. She's been taking her bucket, her bucket, her literal inner self, whatever is, and she's been taking her bucket and she's been dipping it in the waters of life her whole life. So to her, it's second nature. And the last well that they dig, just because in case we don't get back to here, is called Rehovot. How beautiful. Rehovot means an expanse, a width. So we always think of a be'ed in terms of height, in terms of length. You go up, you go down, you go up, you go up, right? We've been talking about the energies from above to the energies from below. But the last well, what does Yitzhak leave us with? He calls it for a strange name. He calls it Rehovot, <coughs> with, wide. Why is it wide? Why would that be such a beautiful name? What did you say? Ki <laughs> Hashem Oh, Ki Hashem Lano, beautiful, because God has made us, uh, um, ex God has expanded us. Beautiful. What does that mean? God has expanded us. Also, we, we want to expand horizontally between us so that we can access the vertical. Uh, you guys are fabulous. <laughs> what brought the Ra'av in the first place? A stinginess. What's mine is mine, a sense of contraction, a sense of I'm going to keep what I have to myself. And in order for the world to be able to be blessed and to be able to produce as it's intended to, what do we have to do? We have to expand and expanding in this type of a horizontal way means being able to connect with other people, to give of myself, to take from others. Imagine if all of the nations shared their best resources with each other. We know, you know, we take it for Israel. Oh, Eretz Israel, we share our vaccines, we share, we have a billion Nobel Peace Prizes. So whatever you want to know in any kind of medical, computers, what do you want to know? Music, uh, um, agriculture, what do you want to know? You, you have a problem, there's somebody stuck in a cave, call the Israelis, they have the technology that could hear sound, I don't know what. This idea of rechovot is not just teaching Yitzchak, it's teaching us. You want to be children of Abraham? You want to be children of Yitzchak? You will be way more successful if you expand rather than if you <coughs> contract. And look at us, look at us on the world stage. Nobody will admit it, so I'll say it here. And I'm sure all of my mother's channels that she watches, the you know Shalom TVs and all that, they'll say it, but the rest of the world won't say it because they don't even know the first thing about what? About expanding, about sharing your resources to benefit the rest of humanity. How many nations today could you say are happy to share their resources to benefit humanity? I'm not gonna name countries, we're being recorded right now, but I will tell you, if you could count them on one hand, it's a lot. I think Eretz Israel is the number one place that from there, all of its marvels and all of its uh, advances are making our world a better place. And I find plus physically and spiritually, the larger the base, the higher you can get up. So he's saying such gorgeous things. If you want to go this way, if you want to go vertical, if you want to go vertical and you have a tiny little base, what's going to happen? There you go. I didn't mean to drop it, but the wider your base, the higher you can build. 
And this is what Yitzchak is telling us. And maybe he's telling it to his own sons. And maybe it's written here specifically so that these two boys could understand what their uh, um, prophecy is. Le'om mi le'om. You know, Yosef, and maybe I'll end with this because I think the words play with each other beautifully. What was the greatness of Yosef's dream? When he said to his brothers, here we were in the field and we were me'almim alumim. Le'om mi le'om. We were tying together bundles. We were tying together sheaves of wheat. The same way you need a wide base to get a tall structure, in order for the wheat not to all get lost in the wind, it needs to be what? Tied and bundled together. Each stalk of wheat is actually helping his neighboring stalks survive. We need each other. The huddling, the gathering is what's going to help us survive. And so I'll just end with this. The first time we see the word be'er appear in text. It might surprise you. I, I couldn't believe that this was the actual first place for it to appear. The first time we see a be'er is be'er lechairo'i. What is that place? It's the place that Hagar names when she's given the news from an angel that she will become pregnant, that she should go back to her master and her mistress who may have been torturing her at the time because she was going to have a child and that child was going to be a pere adam, a wild person. And he is going to be al pene kol echav yishkon. He's going to live amongst all his brothers. Well, guess what? She calls and this is what's so beautiful. If you could turn to chapter 16, verse 13. She calls the name of the God that's speaking to her. And of course, which God is speaking to her? Which name for God is used here? The Yud Kevavke, of course, the God of the womb of the Rachamim is going to speak to her. And she tells him, Ata el roi. I have to hear from Hagar. Hagar is the one to introduce to the world that God is an all-seeing God. And the trick is to say, on the one hand, he's Melech HaOlam, he's the king of the world. What does he have for me? What's my little problem to him? How can he address my tiny little issues? I'm nothing, I'm not even a dot or a blip on the radar. That could be one attitude that we have. But what does Hagad come and tell the world? I'm not, I'm just the maid servant of Abraham, but Ata El Roi, you're a God that sees every single person. She says, I didn't even see myself. I didn't even see my own self, God, and you saw me. And she calls the name of the well, Be'er, Lechai Roi. It is a well that is living, a living well. And what does the well do? It allows one to see. What does that mean? Be'er itself, the word Be'er means Leva'er. What does Leva'er mean? Explain. To explain, to clarify something. So, what is Hagad introducing to us? that if you're gonna go deep, and Yitzchak is doing it in this week's perasha, if you're gonna dig deep, you know what you're gonna actually find? You're gonna see yourself in a different light. You're gonna be able to explain yourself to yourself, or you're going to be able to get some kind of clarity. But if it's, I'm sorry, if Abraham was the one who showed us God, he showed it to us, us, the God that's outside of us. Look at the stars, look at the sun, look at the moon. What does Yitzchak come and do? He takes that very same God and says, yes, you can see God external to yourself, but you can also find God where? Inside that 
infinite spring, that infinite well that you possess inside yourself. And if you go inside, you'll get be'er, you'll get clarity, you'll get a deeper understanding. And maybe you'll be able to see yourself in a way that you never saw yourself before. As a reflection. As a reflection. You're saying, because when you look in water, you could see yourself. And That's you a beautiful you visual. Yourself, so you're, this is your image and you can see- Are you listening to this? This is, this, is, this is magnificent. If you look into water, you know, they say in the- um, Like a mirror. Like a mirror. They say when you have the course for um, Havdalah, you should see your image in the, in the wine reflected because you're being reborn. You have to see yourself. You have to recognize yourself. And when I say yourself, I mean self with a capital S. You have to see your higher self and recognize what Rivka told us in the very beginning of this parasha, which is every single one of us has the right and the responsibility to advocate for the self that we want to see when we look in that mirror. Who do I want to see? Who is my future self? I already was introduced and we'll end with this. The Pirasha started telling me about all my past selves. And in order to achieve my future self, the self that I have to create, the self that I have to imagine I could be, the self that I could only be if I recognize that I'm more than just molecules and cells and whatever is on my surface. How am I going to become that self? That self is going to happen by drawing, drawing literally all the waters, all the energies from my past and then and then seeing myself as this being that God has already said, take one step, I'll meet you the other 99. But take the step, because in taking the step, you're bringing me into your life. You're bringing me into your world. And when I'm on that scale and I'm in that equation, then anything is possible. And with that, we will end our class. I apologize to any of the Zoomers that are left. I'm so sorry we lost connection. Have a beautiful, beautiful day.